Okay, um, I'm Sandy uh, from Lancaster University, and we have Rafaela and Hannah also from Lancaster University. And today we are interviewing uh, Vahid Aryadust, and we're very delighted to have Vahid today. Vahid is Associate Professor of Language Assessment at the National Institute of Education in Singapore. Vahid is also Acting Research Program Leader, member of the Steering Committee of Educational Technology, SGA, member of the Social Science and Humanities Strategic Plan 2025, and chair of the Institutional Review Board, or IRB. Again, thank you very much, Vahid, for accepting our invitation. Uh, thank you very much, Santi and Rafaela. It's really nice to be here, and I hope we're going to have an interesting conversation together. I look forward to it. Yes. Um, could you tell us a bit about your research interests? Sure. Um, yeah, you know, I'm I'm associate professor of language assessment, so I think that, that probably defines my research interests. A language assessment as as a general uh, field, but within language assessment, my focus of uh, research or specialty um, are a few, uh, starting from listening assessment, uh, with specific uh, focus on quantitative data analysis in listening assessment, as well as eye tracking and neuroimaging, with special focus of FNES or functional near infrared spectroscopy, which is a technique that is used for uh, imaging the brain during some functions, some some tasks. I also am quite interested in general education, for example, the impact of environment on students uh, performance, on students grades, the impact of their SES, their educational system on how they perform on language tests or generally speaking on academic tests, but I would I would consider that to be my second area of interest. Uh -huh. Thank you. So most sure. of the studies that you've conducted involved quantitative methods, and we know there is quite wide range of quantitative research methods in educational research and in language testing in particular, as we can see from your two co-edited volumes. Uh, right. Could you tell us some of the sort of main considerations that early career mm -hmm. researchers should have when they uh, decide on which method to use? Well, I think, uh, uh, to be honest, the question may not have a standard answer, so I just share with you my two cents here. Mm -hmm. um, I think the first thing that we need to consider is uh, the research, the research questions that we have, and also the aims of the research that we want to conduct. And once it's clear to us what we really want to do, then to me, as someone who is interested in quantitative data analysis, the second question would be, so how am I going to measure the variables that I need to measure? So that, that becomes the second uh, step in defining the research study that I want to conduct and also uh, implementing it. And, and then I would look into the available literature to find out how other people have done similar studies like me or something that is related to what I'm going to do. Uh, so altogether, I would probably uh, get an idea about the limitations of previous research because, you know, we don't just want to replicate what previous research studies have done. Of, of course, replicability is an important question, but it would be nice to think about how to expand on the methodology and the theoretical implications of previous research. I think this this would agen would make a genuine contribution to the field you, you are investigating. So uh, expansion and extension of the uh, uh, data analysis techniques of the research approach of the data uh, sets or the source, uh, sor uh, sources of data that have been used before would be among other considerations for me if I want to do a research study. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Sure. Yeah. Um, in your YouTube channel, Statistics mm -hmm. and Theory, you share mm -hmm. demonstrations of various quantitative methods. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the fundamental quanti quantitative methods that you feel early career researchers should learn? Mm -hmm. So that's a great question. Um, I would say I, I think researchers should start from learning descriptive statistics, really. Now, uh, um, although they seem to be very easy things like mean, mode, standard deviations, and kurtosis, and things like that, uh, skewness, but they're extremely important because if 
some of the requirements of, let's say, normality, et cetera, are not uh, met uh, in your data set, then you have to think about uh, the inferential statistics in a different way. Uh, so for the first step towards um, achieving your research goals, in my view, is to learn about descriptive statistics. And on top of that, of course, um, I would also uh, do correlation analysis and reliability analysis. That's the first step for me. The second step then is to familiarize myself with uh, inferential statistics. And you know, this is a, a, a very a big area um, and it includes a lot of things. So not to confuse yourself, I would start with uh, GLM, a general linear model. And you know, it's, it's a very uh, big family still. Yeah. Um, it includes t-tests, of course, it's a subject of contention. Some people will say that GLM doesn't include t-tests and some people would still include it under GLM. But anyway, definitely ANOVA is, different types of ANOVA, uh, and ANCOVA, MANOVA, MANCOVA, they're all extensions of um, ANOVA itself and of course different forms of regression. So up to here, I think uh, most of our research needs uh, would be met if we learn how to use and how to interpret the results of GLM analysis. But of course, if you are more adventurous, you can go ahead and, and learn about regression and factor analysis. I would call it step three or stage three in, in your career development. And finally, um, uh, certainly some familiarity and a working knowledge of psychometrics is very helpful because after all, you know, measurement is important in our field, in language assessment and second language acquisition. Measurements um, are, are there, are ubiquitous everywhere. In any research study that you, you know, you pick up and, and you study, um, measurement is there. So psychometrics becomes important. And as a result, uh, something like a rush measurement or simple unidimensional IRT techniques uh, would be very useful. My preference for perhaps some philosophical reasons really um, is rush measurement. So I, uh, if we have time again, I, I can go through some details about that. So this will be the first, I will call it the first or the core uh, uh, statistical techniques that uh, a researcher would benefit from learning. Uh, let's say someone is even more adventurous and wants to go beyond these. Mm -hmm. So I recommend a few here. Um, Structural equation modeling is something that is more advanced because it draws upon uh, regression analysis and also uh, factor analysis and things like that. And then recently we have learned, uh, we've heard a lot about uh, AI, uh, particularly machine learning. Machine learning is something that is becoming inc slowly uh, more um, commonly used in some fields. In, in language assessment. It has been there in uh, in a field like automated writing assessment and automated uh, speaking assessment, mostly in writing assessments. But in other fields, I mean, my, my student, uh, Azrifa, and I are now doing a uh, review of uh, the application of AI and machine learning in language assessment. We see that um, there is an upward trend. It's fledgling, but uh, obviously it's emerging. So. Um, I think machine learning is something that will become a trend in a few years from now. So if someone is looking forward to the future and, and wants to build up some skills that will be more uh, pertinent to the future, I think machine learning is one of those things that uh, should take into account. And la last but not least, my answer is very long for this one, as you see, um, uh, multidimensional measurement models mm -hmm. are also an advanced form of quantitative data analysis, things like CDA or uh, cognitive diagnostic assessment or multidimensional ROSH or IRT analyses are very useful, especially when we have a scenario in which some of the um, underlying assumptions of ROSH measurement, like local independence or unidimensionality is violated. That's not the end of the world. Uh, well, we can use a different model. You know, it doesn't have to be the unidimensional rush model. I think I, I got ahead of myself. I know I've already answered one of the questions that is going to be uh, asked later, <laughs> but I think I elaborate on this later. Yes, we can we can come back to that later. And thank you sure. for for these suggestions and also for mentioning them in sort of stages. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah, this was really thank useful. You. A very useful overview for. Uh, early career researchers, but also more experienced researchers to have an idea of what possible steps 
uh, that could go through in terms of quantitative methods. Um, Vahid, I was just wondering uh, if you if we think about doctoral researchers or so doing a PhD, doctoral researchers tend to focus mainly on the research methods that they use in their PhD study. Uh, but then actually it is important, as you suggested, to be familiar with a range of methods for also future research career. And right. so uh, I was wondering whether you have any advice on the best way to learn uh, other quantitative methods, such as the ones that you've listed. So maybe you could also share your personal experience, uh, how you learned those different methods that you listed. Well, that's a great question. Um, I think before talking about the, the methods and how to learn them, um, I find one important factor in all sort of learning that is necessary, uh, and that's intrinsic motivation, as, as all mm. of us know. And so if you're highly motivated, you can much more easily learn something. You know, you don't care if you make mistakes, if you fall, you stand up again. So um, uh, that, that's the first factor I think that every PhD student, I'm sure most of our PhD students do have this factor because embarking on, an, on a PhD program uh, is really a big commitment and they're ready to make that commitment for obviously, uh, well, some personal reason, of course, because they're motivated to do so. It's my my hunch, I, I suppose it, it makes uh, sense and it probably a lot of uh, PhD students relate to it. Uh, now, how to learn the sort of data analysis methods that are not directly related to your thesis or dissertation, but you feel they they will they would give you give you an edge over the rest of the cohort in the future. If, for example, if you're applying for a job, uh, my own experience was uh, I would always uh, consider uh, looking at the same research questions from different angles. So rather than saying that uh, my listening test or whatever reading test is unidimensional, I, I assume that, well, the test could be multidimensional and this multidimensionality can be captured by using different uh, variable, uh, different uh, models such as multidimensional Rush analysis or, or confirmatory fact analysis or in some cases structural equation modeling. Um, so you will define a, a different types of uh, choices for yourself and you don't you do not just limit yourself to one of them and and then i would say you just go around and start learning about about them the other thing that i find very useful is uh, some familiarity with mathematics and algebra will help a lot because ultimately if you look at the math of let's say irt or rash and compare that with fact analysis and structural equation modeling or things like regression, you see that they have a lot in common. So if you learn about one of them, it will help you a lot to learn the other one as well. So these two things, the relevance of those data analysis techniques and learning about their mathematics, I think can be quite helpful if you want to, you know, go beyond the data analysis methods that are directly related to your thesis. Last but not least, I would say that's a great idea if someone wants to learn more uh, um, and not limit themselves to the data analysis that's pertinent to their research. I think that's a great idea because, like I said, um, that, you know, a small, a short line on your CV indicating that you know X and Y on top of whatever you have done in your uh, thesis or your dissertation can be a game changer for you. They, just based on that, someone could offer you a job that they wouldn't if they didn't see that line. So it's a great idea to expand our uh, experience and uh, knowledge of those uh, techniques and methods as much as we can. Absolutely. Thanks so much. This is great piece of advice. And yeah, um, I definitely agree. So uh, uh, being like getting familiar with different methods, maybe looking at as you said, a research question from different uh, perspectives uh, and points of view, it's, it's a great idea. And then that gives you probably the possibility of comparing different uh, techniques, different methods and uh, considering what the strengths and weaknesses of each of them is. And it's yes, it's a great piece of advice. Thanks so much. Great. Um, yeah. So now 
since our uh, session is mainly focused on rash measurement, after this uh, introduction that we we uh, just had on general quantitative methods, we we will we would like to go on uh, talking about rash measurement more specifically. And uh, our first question here in this uh, part of the interview is, uh, imagine you wanted to produce a sort of a glossary on rash measurement for beginners. Uh, so what are the key terms and the key concepts that you think should be included? And we don't need to give a definition for each of them, just to have a list uh, of key concepts that uh, our participants or uh, the viewers could actually go and look at and study on their own if you, if they want to um, get an introduction on rush. Right, a good question. I would say my list would would have two sections. One section would be optional, so people may or may not learn about it, but I, I would assume that it would help them a lot. As I mentioned before, just building on the answer I provided to the previous question, learning about math is really necessary and, and, and helpful if you want to um, develop a deep understanding of the models. It wouldn't be essential or necessary if you just want to be an end user of the model. You know, you can still run the analysis, you can still make sense of the data, and you don't really need to know what's under the hood. But if you want to know what's under, uh, under the hood, then there are three things that I suggest. And, and that includes understanding probability, uh, some basic understanding of what probability is. Number two is expectations. And number three is, uh, especially about rush, is the logistic function. Is something like a snake, you know. And if anyone is allergic to snakes, it's something like an, like an S shape, you know. Uh, kind of extended S shape, like the differential shape. So uh, these three concepts, I would say, are important. Um, you can just read about them easily on Wikipedia and watch some, you know, free videos available on YouTube or elsewhere. Now about Rush model, I have a list here. I have, by the way, I have two monitors here. That that's why I'm looking away from the camera um, occasionally. So uh, the list is this: item difficulty is for sure important, and the concept of uh, logits or log odd units. Um, I would say learning logistic function will help you more to understand what log odd units is uh, and how to make sense of them. Then person ability is another parameter in rush measurement that we should learn about. Item person map and uh, the consistency of items and persons and uh, uh, their homogeneity. And then reliability and separation is another concept here. Um, they have, again, statistical definitions, but also a non-statistical definition. If we find time later, I'm very happy to uh, provide some details on them. Then there are two assumptions of Rush, of the Rush model, which is the logistic Rush model, which is local independence and unidimensionality. These are the other two concepts that sh we should learn about. Um, if you are using Rush measurement to validate a questionnaire, then there is another assumption or underlying uh, prerequisite for rush analysis, and that's called monotonicity, uh, which again is another concept that I would put on the glossary. And infit and outfit mean square values, z standardized values. Um, there are different forms of infit and outfit, which we have discussed in the paper that was published in language assessment. Uh, but just uh, let's suffice to say that infit and outfit, uh, you know, are the representative of those concepts. And last but not least is differential item functioning. There are different types of differential item functioning. Um, just you know, to, to provide you a very brief summary of them. Uh, one of them is doing differential item functioning by using manifest variables like def across gender, def across age groups, and so on and so forth. And the other type is doing def analysis by using uh, latent class rush measurement models or mixed rush models, which is another approach uh, which builds upon rush on the one hand and latent class cluster analysis on the other hand. And again, of course, you can talk about this in more details if you find time, but I think this summary perhaps provides the bare bone essentials of uh, both differential item functioning and other requirements of rush analysis. Brilliant. Thanks so much. Uh, Thank this you. was a useful list and we'll we'll definitely uh, have a chance to probably talk about 
some of these items a bit more in the next question. Sure, yes. yes. Yeah, thank you for sort of summarizing the key concepts, really. Mm -hmm. So now let's probably step back a little. Could you tell mm -hmm. us a bit more about rush measurement? What is it? And mm -hmm. what is the underlying principle behind it? Sure. Um, so, well, there are two ways of answering the question. One is the history of rush. And it has been, you know, discussed in um, books and chapters and papers. In our paper, we also touched on it, and we have provided a list of other papers and uh, resources for readers. So uh, let's put their history on the back burner. All of us know that Rush measurement uh, started by um, George Rush or George Rush, the Danish statistician and mathematician. Um, so there is a lot. A lot more about the history, but let's just talk about the rush model um, in the interest of time. A rush model is a simple, useful uh, logistic model that um, basically allows you to compute the the probability of a person with a certain ability level uh, answering an item with a certain difficulty level correctly or incorrectly. So it's a probabilistic model and um, it, it's based on the uh, logistic function that I mentioned before, and um, it, it allows you to measure those two parameters. Uh, there are different ways of quantifying those parameters. For example, the unconditional uh, way of def defining and, and quantifying the parameters, or the prox way. A prox way is, is a use, uh, in my view, is a very useful way. It's an old one. Um, but it's useful in the sense that you can actually sit down and really use a pencil and, and a piece of paper and just go through the steps of prox and get a very clear idea how parameters are, are estimated and then how you can plug them into the model and then estimate the probability of people with different ability levels to answer certain items correctly or incorrectly. So a long story short, it, it it's a probabilistic model that allows us to do what I just said. I don't want to repeat it again. Um, but on top of that, it also allows you to um, psychometrically validate your instruments. For example, if you are a uh, test taker with a high ability, mm -hmm. um, we would expect that you answer easy items. And if you your ability is low with respect to the test items difficulty, then we would expect that you would probably miss some of those items. So with this very simple uh, assumption, uh, Rush will allow you to find out whether um, you meet these assumptions or there is an anomaly or some kind of perturbation in the data that uh, you need uh, the, the test developer needs to look into and probably solve the problems. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that answers your question. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, yes. Uh, okay, good. Uh, we know that it's uh, commonly used within social sciences, but could you tell us a bit more like in what disciplines or fields specifically within social sciences where rush measurement model has been used? Sure. Um, we we conducted a review uh, using a technical scientometrics. We used something around 4,700 plus papers. We fed the uh, fed all of them into the software called a software package called Sci uh, CiteSpace. And uh, anyway, long story short, we found that the application of Rush measurement basically is not just related to the fields that we know in social sciences. It's way beyond. It goes way beyond that. And f in fields like medicine, uh, medical sciences in general. Um, I'm just groping for the be a better word, but I think medical sciences might be clear to people who who, who hear it, who hear it. So um, yeah, in medical sciences, it's used quite a lot in questionnaire developments. For example, in the rehabilitation field, um, I've seen quite a few examples of um, questionnaires that have been developed to uh, f uh, to measure the ability of people who have been uh, inflicted with stroke. Mm -hmm. uh, to see if they can move different parts of the body and, and how mobile they are. And, and then after a period of time, how much 
uh, improvement they make in the re rehabilitation program and things like that. Uh, so uh, you see the um, the area of using rush measurement is, is quite widespread. In social sciences, it's used for particularly for questionnaire development. Mm -hmm. uh, there are all sorts of questionnaires that have been developed and validated psychometrically using rush measurement, different types of rush models. And in language assessment, I would say uh, there is a considerable number of papers uh, in which Rush has been used. In our paper, we looked at uh, 21 journals, um, mm -hmm. and of course, there are a lot more journals than 21 in the field of language learning, applied linguistics. We found 200 and if I'm not wrong, 200, 200 plus. I don't exactly remember the number, but 200 plus papers that used Rush measurement, and the uh, we also found that the trajectory of using it is upwards. Mm. And yeah, yeah. So long story short, again, um, there are many fields in which this technique is being used, and and luckily uh, or fortunately, in my view, one of them is language assessment. Yeah, so it's yeah, it's been used in quite a wide variety of fields, not just within social sciences. Uh, yeah. You mentioned earlier about different types of rush models. Uh, could you expand on that? Like, what are the types? Well, sure. Uh, generally, I would say there are two types of rush model. Uh, from this, the perspective of dimensionality, uh, one group or one family is known as unidimensional models mm -hmm. and within that family you see there are a lot of members and another family is the multi-dimensional uh, family of rush models for unidimensional ones we have models uh, actually there's a long list of them but some of the most commonly used ones in language assessment uh, include uh, the rush model itself which is the logistic one and the rating scale model, the partial credit model, the many facets rush measurement model, uh, to name a few. Um, in the multidimensional field, uh, there have been a lot of improvements, especially in the recent years. Uh, there are bifactor models, test test models, mul just multidimensional, you know, conventional multidimensional uh, rush models. Um, yeah, and like I said, uh, there is another field, uh, another let's say group of models, which which is known as mixture rush models. It all started in run um, in the early 1990s mm -hmm. uh, by Professor Rost and his colleagues like Von Davier and later on many other people uh, who researched this field. Uh, they developed this mixture rush model in of course, recently we see um, other types like uh, rush trees, different type of rush trees in which the classification and regression trees and rush models are combined and a lot more than that, you know, Bayesian rush and uh, this list is non exhaustive as you can imagine. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, yeah, thank you for mentioning some of them. So now let's uh, probably talk about the application of rush in educational research or language testing specifically. So could you give us some examples of the types of research questions that can be addressed using rush measurement models? Well, rush measurement is um, primarily used for validation purposes. In mm. other words, to validate your instruments psychometrically before you want to use them to draw a conclusion about the um, application of a test method or about the proficiency or ability of some test takers. Uh, so the first step uh, is to make sure that your instrument is telling the truth to you. It's not giving you some sort of unreliable, invalid uh, sort of uh, sc scores or understanding of the, the, the ability of the test, person, the test taker. Uh, I think that's the most important thing for us. So um, it's a general application and, and, and as a result, a lot of researchers can use it before they uh, answer their actual research questions in their studies. Mm -hmm. let's, let's take an example here. Say, let's say you want to measure um, listening anxiety um, and then uh, find out the correlation between listening anxiety and listening test performance. 
but the first step for you is to find out whether the instruments are reliable and good enough for you to measure listening anxiety and listening performance. Uh, so this is where rush measurement can come to, into the picture and can help you to uh, validate your instruments mm -hmm. psychometrically to tell you which one of the items can be used and which one of them can probably not be used and should be removed before you add up the scores and correlate the scores from listening uh, and scores from the anxiety instrument. So yes, psychometric validation and also in, in understanding the reliability of the instrument. Mm -hmm. I, I should say that Wright and Stone uh, have published a book which is actually freely available online. If um, your viewers are interested, they can look at the references section of my my Rush review paper. I don't remember the exact title of the paper, but uh, Wright and Stone in 1999, uh, they, they give a lot of useful information about what kind of uh, uh, validity uh, evidence the Rush measurement can produce and how they, they can be used in research. Yes, thank you. I think probably later we can also add the link to your review and also the link to the paper that you mentioned. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, just uh, thinking about our viewers and the participants that registered for uh, for our session, um, they uh, did a, a, some, a reading to prepare for the session and they submitted some of some possible questions. And one of the question um, relates to the output of rash analysis part of the output of rush analysis. And uh, some of the participants were wondering what the difference between person separation and item separation is. So how can these statistics be interpreted? Could you tell us a bit more about this? Sure, absolutely. Um, so rush um, analysis provides you with uh, indices of reliability and in indices of separation. Um, reliability in rush is can be uh, viewed as analogous to Kerder Richardson or KR20 uh, formula of reliability or something like a Combox Alpha. So you can interpret it in almost in the same way with one exception. I, I find out that um, in most fields of research in applied linguistics or other fields beyond applied linguistics, people assume that if Combox Alpha is at least 0 0.7 and above that, it's um, excellent Combox Alpha, where it is, um, you know, more productive. Uh, in rush measurement, however, um, that level is slightly above 0 0.7. It's actually 0 0.8. Uh, why is it so? It's because of another concept called separation, which we, you just mentioned. Separation is the number of statistically significantly different groups of people or groups of items that can be differentiated by using the instrument uh, that uh, you have created. So in order to have at least two groups in your items, me meaning to be able to cluster your items into two groups of difficulty or to be able to uh, cluster your persons to two diff different groups of ability, uh, you need to have a reliability index of 0 0.8, which equals a separation index of uh, two. So it's like a con con the conversion of one to another. It's like you, you're using, sometimes I use this analogy, you're using Celsius in one of them and uh, Fahrenheit in another or the other way around. But, the, but they're actually, telling you the same story. Um, generally speaking, if you have two uh, groups, two distinguishable groups in your items or in your, in your, or in your uh, um, persons or people who are taking the test, you can consider the test to be reliable or precise in distinguishing people who have high ability versus those who have low ability and items which have got high difficulty versus those that have, have got low diff, high and low difficulty. Um, in other words, a high reliability and separation index um, indicates that those people or, or items that have gotten a high measure, they genuinely have a high measure that is high ability or high difficulty. And those people who have got a lower measure, 
they actually do have a lower measure or, or low difficulty or low ability. Um, how, however, the last thing about it, if you don't get a high reliability, does not mean that your data is bad? Naturally, it just simply means that uh, there was not a good match between the difficulty of your test and the ability of the people. I mean, it, it might be surprising to hear this, but uh, sometimes it's actually good news. Why is it good news? Because uh, let's assume that you start a program, uh, you give the test takers a pretest, th those people who go through your program uh, take the pretest. And in the pretest, you find that, oh, okay, there's a good match between the test items and people. But then the program uh, teaches them and nurtures them and provides them with opportunities to learn. By the end of the program, those test items become quite easy for, for these people. So the matching is not there anymore. So people start to move up the scale, whereas the items remain where they are. In this case, because there is no good match between the items and the people in your uh, sample, then uh, you would you would see a uh, low difficult, uh, lo sorry, low reliability estimate, and as a result of low separation index. So this is not bad news for you. Ah, perfect. Thanks so much. And it's really helpful to have examples and analogies. So this is really good. helpful. Thanks so much. Oh, good to hear that. <laughs> um, our next couple of questions will be based on the comprehensive review of Rush that you co-authored with Li Ying Ng and Hiroki Sayama, published in Language Testing in 2021. I think you mentioned some of them already, so um, I'd like to ask about the three requirements that, again, you already introduced, uh, data to model fit, unidimensionality and local independence. Uh, right. Could you briefly explain each one of them? Sure. Um, as I said before, rush measurement is a probabilistic model mm -hmm. and it actually predicts the probability of people answering items with different uh, degrees of difficulty. Again, let's uh, imagine that S-shaped curve that I mentioned before. That's the perfect rush model. We, in a real life, we never see any data set that perfectly fits that, that uh, curve. Um, if you um, graph people around the curve, you see that some people would, would fall slightly below the curve, some people would fall slightly above it, some people would fall far from it, some people might just fall on the curve. They perfectly fit the Rush model itself. Now, there's always a distance between the, the people and the curve. The people here uh, represent the actual performance of the test taker, and the curve represents the perfect world that Rush imagines. All right, so what should we do with this uh, distance between people and the perfect world of Rush? Well, we can do analysis on them, because, uh, you know, because they're data. So when, when you, once you have got data, then you have got data analysis methods, so you can run analysis on them. What kind of analysis can we do on that? Uh, three things, uh, fit analysis is one of them, uh, unidimensionality analysis, and of course, uh, local independence analysis. So fit is one quant uh, quantitative method to understand the differences between what Rush expects and what people have actually done, or the other way around, what Rush expects and what uh, how items uh, functioned. Mm -hmm. So it applies to both people and items. So that's fit. And it's actually a chi-squared if you think about it. It's a chi-squared uh, between um, um, items, um, or in this case, persons, and the actual performance, and what the rush me measurement actually expects. Uh, if it's statistically significant, then there is a statistical, uh, statistically significant deviation from what rush measurement expects, and that could be taken as uh, evidence for anomalies in your data. So you should go back to where that anomaly occurred, zoom in, and find out what's going on there. Uh, local independence and uh, um, what's the other one? Unidimensionality are also based upon a similar concept uh, in the sense that you need to look into the residuals, and residuals are the differences between the actual performance of test takers or the actual difficulty of, of items and the perfect rush curve. Uh, you take those residuals, you standardize them, 
and then you can run all sorts of analyses on, on those standardized rush residuals and uh, one of them is principal component analysis like the usual conventional uh, principal component analysis to see uh, if there is any substantive dimension underlying these residuals you know it's like to find the diamond in the rough if you will and if you can find anything that's substantive then what do you want to do with this secondary dimension that you have found in those residuals? The residuals are things that we basically throw out, mm -hmm. you know, like the trash. But what if you find something valuable, actually more valuable than what, what is considered to be valuable? Mm -hmm. So in this case, I think if it's in measurement, you could be facing some problems here. Mm -hmm. um, because you know you you didn't really expect that the, the trash you're throwing away would have something valuable in it but now you found something valuable it could be trouble it could be okay so as a result the, the sort of dimensions that you find in uh, residuals are of two types auxiliary dimensions which are just secondary dimensions which are um, attached to the main or the primary dimensions and they don't actually create any problems uh, for example, you're testing reading comprehension mm -hmm. and then you find that some of the items cluster together and create a secondary dimension. And when you look at the test items, you find out that, oh, the reason why they are clustering together and s isolating themselves from the rest of the cohort is that, let's say, all of them are testing vocabulary or something else. In this case, you can say, okay, th because vocabulary is a dimension of reading, mm -hmm. then it's fine. Um, some dimensions, on the other hand, are nuisance dimensions, mm -hmm. and they actually create adverse um, variance in your data. And those are the, the dimensions that we must be concerned about. A traditional example that you probably read in in many uh, standard textbooks in IRT and and Rush measurement is when you have a test of mathematics. Uh, you find out that understanding some of the items is heavily dependent upon reading comprehension of test takers and some test takers mm -hmm. might be uh, you know L2 or L3 or even LN learners so they might have difficulty understanding the test items mm -hmm. it doesn't indicate that their performance doesn't indicate that they were not good mathematicians mm -hmm. they might have been very good mathematicians but they just didn't understand those words so they could create adverse variants mm -hmm. that's the area that we should be concerned about oh and last but not least is Local independence. Local independence is also very similar to unidimensionality. The difference is that in um, local independence analysis, instead of uh, running principal uh, fact, uh, principal component analysis on the residuals, you run correlation between those um, uh, residuals. So if you get significant correlation statistics, at least 0.3 and above that, um, it could indicate that some of the items are locally dependent. And if items are locally dependent, uh, your estimation of people ability and item difficulty could be biased, could be somewhat unreliable, but I would say local independence wouldn't be as big pro a problem as uh, multidimensionality is mm -hmm. in uh, usual uh, unidimensional rush analysis. Thank you. Thank that was you a very long that. answer. I <laughs> but very, very clear explanation. Yes, okay. very clear explanation with lots of very illustrations. Good. So with unidimensionality, we need to sort of examine further what the secondary dimensions are and whether or not they will um, affect the measurement of you know the target construct. Maybe. Yeah, precisely. You have yes, actually answered some of my next questions. <laughs> so, Very good. Um, <laughs> yes. And um, I remember that you also mentioned in the paper that it was quite alarming to see that only very few pa uh, papers or journal articles that actually reported unidimensionality and local independence checks. Right. Um, do you have any idea why that's the case? Um, honestly, I don't know to to <laughs> to tell you the truth, but I can hazard a guess. Mm -hmm. um, one reason might be the length of the paper. Um, <laughs> you know, you in some journal 
in actually all journals nowadays, you have very uh, strict mm -hmm. word count requirements, so you have to adhere to them. And reporting unidimensionality and local independence results uh, means that you have to spend at least about 500 more words, you know. Mm. Yeah, in some cases, people have to spend more. Mm -hmm. So this is out of pragmatism and practicality. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, I would probably, if I were the editor or the reviewer, I would probably ask the author uh, to provide statistical evidence mm -hmm. in a supplemental file. I think this this is how language testing, the journal language testing, does it now. Even if it it's, it doesn't appear in the main paper, that supplemental file will appear on the journal page, and people can access it. It it will be very useful because for future. Um, if any researcher wants to replicate that study, mm -hmm. there's a very good point of reference so they can look at their statistical methods and their um, outputs and they compare that with the outputs of that study. So that's one thing. The other thing is, and I hope I'm totally wrong about it, but I guess another reason might be that people didn't think it's important at all mm -hmm. or they probably thought who cares about it or some people might have might have not been very uh, familiar with the concept of unidimensionality. So all of these guesses can be made, and I hope some researchers in the future can do further follow-up investigation to figure out mm -hmm. what might have gone wrong there. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, but I like your idea, your suggestion about sort of adding supplementary material, so it won't add the word count, or I think nowadays we can deposit the sort of extra tables or even data in some online repository, for example. That's right. Yeah. So I think you mentioned already earlier about about the upward trend in the use of rush mm -hmm. measurement, especially in right. language testing uh, from the 1980s to the present day. Do you think right. this trend will likely to continue? Uh, that's a very good question, but it's a very difficult one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because, you know, we can make forecasts and predictions about the future, but they may completely be wrong. You know. But based on the data that we have now, um, since the, the trend is upward and it has mostly been upward, I think the trend will continue at least for a few more years, mm -hmm. perhaps at least for one more decade. And what will change this trend depend on quite a lot of uh, factors. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I don't know, people might start to learn about machine learning and AI, then they feel this is a much better idea. So I'm going to use AI and, um, you know, machine learning and answer my research question through this. Um, I would say it's 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 possible that machine learning and AI will will become common, but not in short run and maybe in long run, maybe in a few years down the road, because, you know, it's not something that is so-called indigenous to language assessment. It comes from outside from other fields. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the uptake of the techniques in uh, in our field. Uh, rush measurement will continue to uh, thrive and to be used by researchers for at least 10 more years, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a prediction. I might I might be wrong in a few years, you know, in two years you might say, hey, you, you, you predicted <laughs> that it will continue and look at the trend is completely downwards. Uh, yeah, but I assume there will be increasingly more people to use rush measurement in, in the future. Yeah, thank thank you for answering my difficult question. Uh, <laughs> so we can I can probably organize another interview in ten years and see if exactly. your predictions were correct. Exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it would be very interesting. <laughs> I think now we're fully sort of convinced of the usefulness of rush measurement in language testing and also beyond. Could you recommend some books or resources that would be useful for early career researchers wishing to learn rush measurement? Sure. Well, um, there's a long list and I can send the list to you later. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I have made a slide here um, in which there are quite a few books mm -hmm. and I should add that this is a non-exhaustive list. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot more books than this. But just off the top of my head, um, for example, a book by um, Angel Hart, 
um, Professor George Angel Hart call invariant measurement is one good option to start. Uh, the famous book, uh, Bond and Fox, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, applying the Rush model. Now the new version, the new edition of it is out. Edition, I think it should be edition four, is out. Um, again, another book by Angel Hart, invariant measurement with uh, raters and rating scales. So this is uh, an introduction to many facets Rush measurement. And on that note, I'd like to introduce another book, uh, many fastest rush, rush measurement, and that's the book by Thomas Eckes, our colleague in language assessment field. This is just called Introduction to Many Fastest Rush Measurement. Now, if uh, um, people are interested to learn a little bit about more, more about the mathematics of Rush, um, which I think is a good idea, really, um, one of my suggestions will be best test design by Wright and Stone in uh, 1979, if I'm not wrong. And it's it's actually free. You can just download it for free on the website of winsteps.com. So another book is called Using R for Item Re Response Theory Model Applications. Uh, this is a great book, uh, especially if you like R programming. Um, it gives you a lot of information about different packages in R, like MIRT or MIRT. Mm -hmm. and LTM and other packages. Um, so that's about R. Now, um, about item response theory, um, I think the book by Susan um, Emerson and Rice, if, I hope I read the name correctly, R-E-I-S-E, -E, uh, item response theory for psychologists. Mm -hmm. And another book is the basics of item response theory using R. Again, this is another R-based um, source. Another book, of the very famous one by Hamilton and um, uh, his colleague, Item Response Theory, Principles and Applications are good sources. And in our two volumes, uh, Quantitative Data Analysis, uh, I'm sorry for this um, shameless um, publicizing of my own work here, but we have quite a few good chapters. Actually, our, our colleagues have really done a great job in, in writing those chapters and introducing both unidimensional and multidimensional types of rush analysis. Um, that's also another possible venue for people who like to read about rush analysis. Again, I should stress that this is not an exhaustive list. I hope the great authors who have written about rush and IRT, uh, if they do not hear <laughs> their own names or their, the, the name of their books, they don't get feel offended. Um, it's just, you know, some samples, some examples of the very many books that are available in the field. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, for um, mentioning those different books. And of course, there are obviously more. But as a start, I think we've got quite a few already. And of course, I would like to add that your YouTube channel, Statistics and Theory, also has videos um, about Rush measurement models, right? Right, and please allow me to add that mm -hmm. uh, I'm working on a series of R videos on uh, how to use R Studio. And I think uh, since R is available in, in uh, a free package, a lot of people will benefit from learning how to use R. So in some of the videos that I'm now planning to create, mm -hmm. uh, I will talk about how to use R Mm -hmm. for item response theory analysis and rush measurement. Uh, if we find time, I would also like to just very briefly talk about IRT and rush. Uh, yes, of course, know. yes. Mm -hmm. So is rush part of IRT or the two are different? Well, I think we just uh, opened a can of worms. Uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> there is a, uh, there is a lot of discussion about this. Uh, scholars uh, who are, you know, in the field of Rush measurement and scholars in IRT have had a lot of debates as to whether Rush is an IRT or not. I think the the crux of the idea is that Rush and the family of Rush models were being developed quite completely independently from IRT models, and they were being developed in two different parts of the world, but. By some coincidence, uh, they were being developed based on more or less the same ideas, the same mathematical ideas, and that's really marvelous. Um, I've talked to many people in the field of rush measurement, and 
um, it seems that uh, the developers at Rush, especially George Rush himself, didn't meet with people in the US who were developing IRT as they were developing it. But later on, of course, there were more connections and collaborations. Rush went to the US and I think he had talks. People from ETS had had more conversations with him and so on. But uh, it's a fact that these two groups of models were being developed independently from each other. And in fact, I can venture to say that uh, at the beginning, uh, the Rush and Frederick Lord and other people who were developing IRT were not even aware that similar works are being done mm -hmm. uh, in, in another part of the world. And if uh, anyone is in, interested, I recommend the book called Measuring the Mind uh, by Danny Borsboom, um, who talks about this, um, you know, coincidence, this historical coincidence, uh, very eloquently and very nicely. And of course, another type of models, statistical models that were being developed was um, structural equation modeling and confirmatory fact analysis around the same time. And if you look at the mathematics of these groups of models, they have a lot in common. So as to whether Rush is an IRT model, from this perspective, not really, it's, it's a separate one. But when you look at the math underlying Rush and IRT, um, then yeah, you can say they're all from coming from the same family. However, there is a philosophical difference between the two that actually has a very significant impl implication here. What is that? Rush is a um, kind of confirmatory of approach, is kind of uh, a prescriptive approach as opposed to IRT, which is descriptive. It's pretty much like statistical testing. Uh, so Rush is not assumed by, uh, you know, the fans of Rush measurement and those who, who are in the field of Rush to be a statistical ap approach. It's a measurement approach. So um, the data is supposed to fit the Rush model, and that's how the terminology that's used and the, the, how people say it. On the other hand, in IRT, it's the model that has to fit the data. So if a one PL or one parameter logistic model, which is analogous to Rush, doesn't fit the data, you drop it, mm -hmm. then you fit a two PL. And if it doesn't fit the data, you abandon that and you go for, for a three PL. Most often the two PL is the best match for the data that we have in, in language assessment. Um, so Rush, um, Rush's philosophy is different. If the data doesn't fit the model, then there is a problem with the data, not the model. Uh, but in IRT, it's the other way around. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very you know interesting discussion. So then in IR IRT, uh, you should consider additional parameters mm -hmm. on top of the theta and beta, which are used in Rush. Then you have to multiply the uh, theta minus beta by, um, for example, discrimination, which is A or alpha. Or in the three parameter logistic model, you have to bring in the 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 intercept or um, the pseudo guessing, which becomes another parameter in the model that has to be estimated. My own understanding is, and I know some people or many people probably do not agree with me. Um, if you really want to do measurement, um, it will be much easier to do it using Rush. Uh, why is it so? Because let's say you, you're doing a two parameter logistic model and you fit it to the data and it fits well. Uh, but now you have added the parameter of discrimination mm -hmm. and that could be a little bit confusing. Why? Because the probability of answering the item, any item correctly, is not anymore determined by only person ability and item difficulty. Uh, there comes in another parameter, which is discrimination. And it also share, uh, shares some, um, I mean, explains some share of variance there. So it becomes a bit difficult for you, perhaps even impossible uh, for you to uh, arrange people along the same line and compare them directly with each other because you wouldn't know um, who is affected by discrimination to what um, and to what extent? Mm -hmm. If you correlate people's um, row scores with their um, measurement, measured scores in IRT analysis, you see that those people who are at the bottom of the scale and those people who are at the top of the scale do not have a very good fit there. Mm -hmm. um, there's not a very good correlation between their row scores and um, 
their IRT scores. And the reason is that their scores, their final uh, logits or probits, if you will, um, are affected by the discrimination value of the item. Mm -hmm. Whereas in rush measurement, these two parameters, item difficulty and person ability, um, are independent. Mm -hmm. And that's called specific objectivity. Yeah, I, I think that that's probably just enough for <laughs> the audience because yeah. uh, it could be quite tiring to. Yeah, thank you. I think but the, the uh, basic philosophy that you mentioned, whether it's the data that has to fit the model or the model that has to fit the data, I think that, you know, that kind of explains the basic difference, I would say. Right, very good. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. It, it's really fascinating to uh, also hear about the debates that are uh, within the field. Uh, so moving on to the uh, last part of our interview. So just very briefly, we've already mentioned some of these things, but um, so we've mentioned that RASH is linked to differential item functioning or DIF. And um, so generally two methods of detecting DIF are uh, mentioned in a measurement instrument. So either using manifest variables or adopting latent class techniques. Could you briefly explain the difference between these two approaches? Yeah, for so yeah, there are two groups, the two types of differential item functioning techniques, as you said. One one of them is based on manifest variables, and the other one is based on the so-called mixture rush model analysis, which is a latent class uh, technique or approach to doing rush analysis. So the first one. Uh, based on manifest variables uses a manifest variable like gender or uh, groups like SES or something else. Um, it's usually a categorical variable and um, what you, you need to do is to run a usual rush analysis uh, followed by a differential item functioning analysis. What you will learn about the groups that have taken the test is whether any of the groups uh, has a higher chance of answering the test items correctly compared with another group. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is that in this analysis, you compare people of the same ability level, but in different groups together. Yeah. So those people who are on top of the hierarchy will be compared with each other, male high ability versus female high ability mm -hmm. and so on. And this will allow you to do differential item functioning. There are two types of it, uniform and non-uniform differential item functioning. And that that all depends on um, whether the so-called ICC curves um, are the same for the two groups or they flip around at some point around the mid of the ICC curves. I don't go into too much detail here. I think uh, at, in the in interest of time, um, so the other type of differential item function analysis, as you mentioned, is latent class based sort of rush analysis or mixture rush analysis. How do we do this? Well, the algorithm first divides the groups into two latent classes or three latent classes or more, uh, depending on the sample size and many other factors. And once you did this, then you compare uh, the probability of each group to answer that the items correctly or incorrectly then uh, in some cases you might find that one group, one latent group, um, has an ad advantage over another latent group in answering, let's say, five items or ten items. So here um, you do not have any idea as to whether there is a differential item functioning factor that causes mm. the, the death. You're just exploring to see if Right. Uh, there are two groups or three groups in terms of their probability to answer the test items correctly. And once you found those groups, then you can define them. You can do post hoc analysis to mm -hmm. see what differentiates these groups from each other. Perfect. Thanks so much. Sure. And so just for our final question, um, okay. thinking about the uh, application of rash measurement to questionnaire design, what are the, advant the advantages and uh, is it recommended to investigate uh, DIF in questionnaires? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so 
it offers you also the advantages that I mentioned before. You can run the unidimensionality analysis. You can look into item difficulty, which by the way is called endorsability in the context of questionnaires because you don't have any difficulty in a uh, conventional sense. Here it's the difficulty to endorse the item highly or lowly. So that's that's where the term endorsability comes from. Um, you can also look into differential item functioning, although I should say it's not as common mm -hmm. as DIF analysis in tests of ability or proficiency. Um, one reason why it might not be as common is that uh, for this type of analysis, you would need a very large sample. So once the number of parameter parameters increases, because here you will have three parameters. Uh, one is the item difficulty, the, one is, the other one is person ability, and the other one is the tau parameter or the step difficulty parameter. So you, you're mm -hmm. going to have three parameters. As the number of those parameters increases, you will need to have a larger sample size. Uh, otherwise, um, your estimation of those parameters will not be highly reliable. You may get uh, higher standard errors of measurement. Uh, you know, the higher the standard error, the less reliable your estimations are. So yeah, it's not as common, but it is highly recommended to do differential item functioning on questionnaires uh, because in the same way, you need to make sure that um, the, the quality of items remains the same and inv is invariant across different groups of people. Great, thanks. And, and we'll have a chance to actually talk about this a bit more during our practical session with the participants that registered for it. Uh, I think this was the right. last point, the last question that we wanted to ask you. And uh, well, we're very grateful for your time and for uh, uh, this uh, uh, this fascinating overview of uh, Rush. Uh, you can definitely tell your passion uh, and your experience. So you've made very useful examples for our viewers and I personally learned a lot about it. So uh, I'm curious about exploring more and reading more on it. Um, I'm not, uh, uh, well, if you want to add anything, uh, please uh, feel free to do it now. Just wanted to thank you guys for the invitation. It was really a very nice chat with you. And I hope the answers I've provided are satisfactory to the people who view the video later. If in case they still have questions, um, well, those who come to the workshop, they can ask the questions. Those who you know, don't go to the workshop, um, they can always leave comments or answers at the bottom of the video and I'll yeah. be happy to answer them as long as I, c I can see them, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's a great idea. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you very much.